All right, so uh, I posted up a couple things. Um, one thing I've realized is that connect assignment, I'm gonna push the due date up a little bit because some of the like questions towards the end of it, we actually won't be going through that stuff until kind of today and next class. So I'll probably push that due date to, I think it was on next Wednesday, I'm gonna push that to next Friday as well. So I think it's uh, the Excel and the Connect, I believe it's the 11th will be that Friday. So it's gonna be due at the end of next week, okay? Um, I think if I have it correct, I think there's three of you who have emailed me that I haven't gotten data to. Everyone else, I, I believe I have if you've emailed me. If I haven't, um, you want a reminder, especially if you emailed me a while ago, uh, I definitely think that I have sent it to you. Um, one person emailed me and I had it sitting in my draft box. It didn't send. So uh, unless you've emailed me in the last couple of days, um, and I, think, I think there's three of you that's still need to get to. If you emailed me a while ago about that, for some reason, I still haven't sent you an email or a file. Please reach back out to me for that. Okay. Um, so, with that being said, let's pick up where we left off. So, we were talking about the variance last class. Um, and we kind of walked through. There's two different ways to do it. Uh, I, I didn't spend as much time on the second way where uh, we use this equation. And really the reasoning as to why is the original equation I, I explained the variance to you is really captures more of what exactly is going on with that variance, right? So we've got the deviation from the mean in there. So every time we see really large deviations from the mean, it was adding a lot to the, to the numerator, adding a lot to our variance. And so that first form that I showed you really kind of captures more of the characteristic of what the variance is measuring. The second one works. You can use it to calculate the variance and get the exact same answer. But this one kind of captures a little bit more about those, you know, what's going on with the variance. Okay. We walked through this ball state football salary kind of data set. I believe we left off right here, right? We didn't work through this one. I think I'd save some other examples for next class. So, all right. So, I think it's going to do something. If it does that, let me know. I'm probably going to have to just unplug this until we want to use it. We're having issues in class. Hopefully everyone in Zoom is still seeing the slides. Get a confirmation that would give me a little peace of mind. And then we'll get started next time. All right, awesome. So let's say we have this um, sample like data set. And actually, I believe we're gonna treat it as a population, my bad. Treat it as a population data set. We looked at it with the means last class, it's commute time, right? So if I want to find the population variance for this commute time, just as kind of a reminder, the steps I'm gonna go through is first, I need the mean. Well, I already kind of reminded you, we found that last class, that mean was 45. I'll then go through every observation, right? Subtract the mean and then square that deviation. So for the very first one, it'd be 20 minus 45. So it's 20, negative 25. Square that value, write that number down. I think that's, uh, 625, yeah, so 625, 35 minus 45, that's negative 10, square that, it's 100, I'll write that number down. I keep going through every observation and doing that process. Once I get done, I then add them all up. And with a population variance, I simply divide by the number of observations in that data set, right? So I'll divide by seven, okay? Now, if I just look at this, I don't think I mentioned this last class, What's the lowest possible variance you could ever see? Zero, right? Because the lowest deviation from the mean you can ever see, well, sorry, the lowest deviation from the mean squared you could ever see is zero. Because even if you're below the mean in a negative value, just like that negative 10, when I square it, it's 100, right? So what would a data set have to look like if I had a variance of zero? Every single number would not vary from the mean. So it would have to be a data set with all ones, all 50, all 100, right? Now, obviously, this data set we have here is not all the same value. So we automatically know that zero can't be there, right? But if we go through this process, right, I square those deviations, add them all up, I'll get 2,900. Okay? I then divide by the total number of observations in that data set, and I'll get that population variance of 414. Now, if for some reason, right, I look at this and I thought I had every single employee and someone comes back and goes, no, 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 this is just like one division. You know, there's a 
ton more employees with commute times here. This is just sample data. This is just sample data. What's the only thing that I have to change? So there's one key difference between the population and sample variance. And I kind of glossed over the reason why, but I said for now, just know that it's the case. So the population variance, we divided by n, the number of observations. And the sample variance, we divided by n minus 1, right? And this is kind of accounting for the fact that there's some bias in our sample variance, and so we're trying to correct for it. We'll talk more about that when we get to things like interval, um, confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. But for now, we just need to know that there is that difference. We need to account for the bias. And so if this was sample data, this doesn't change. The process of finding the variance doesn't change at all up to this point. The only thing that changes, instead of dividing by 7, we'd be dividing by 6. Right? So if I divide by a smaller number, what's going to happen to my variance here? It's going to go up. So if I look at a question like this, same data set, but I said, say, instead now, I incorrectly identified it as a population data set, and now I'm correctly identifying that this is actually just sample data. I know that if before the variance I found was 414, the new answer has to be higher. The only option here that makes any sense is 483. Right? If I was asking this like an online quiz question or something, but I can go ahead. The notation changes because I'm using the sample mean instead of the population mean, but the process doesn't change at all. I still square those deviations from the mean, add them all up. But now instead of dividing by n, I divide by, excuse me, n minus one. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll give you, uh, it, so we could go with a long discussion with this, but the idea is if I only have sample data, that sample variance will always be an inaccurate measure of what the actual population range is. There's always a bias built into it. Because think about it this way: um, if I had, even if I correctly captured the variance with a sample data set, I'm going to have more observations that are further from the mean. So they're going to be adding. Like, let's say I had half the observations, there'd be twice as many values being added into that numerator. So there's always going to be a bias that's built in to that sample variance, and subtracting or dividing by n minus one instead of n tries to correct for that bias, right? Like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about that once we get to using these sample means to get an idea about what the population mean is. But for now, we just know that there's, there's some difference there. Hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit. All right, that's a good question. I'm sorry, the question there was, why do we buy the NIS one? Hopefully on, on Zoom, you kind of could have figured that out. We were talking about that beforehand. I don't want to waste too much time on this. I just want to start to think about, we haven't looked at these nice continuous distributions. All we've done is looked at like histograms, right? And kind of said, if I tried to trace out what the, the continuous distribution would look like, what would it look like? But remember, when we did those histograms, one thing we could have used on the y-axis was the relative frequency. And that really just told us the proportion of our observations that we saw at different values, okay? So what this is trying to display is each one of these different distributions is a different color, and they all have different standard deviations or they have different variances, right? We said the standard deviation, how do I get that from the variance? Just the, can you remember? Yeah, just the square root, right? So they're, they're, the, they're just the, you know, scaling that a little bit, right? So if I had all these distributions and they all have the same mean, and that mean is zero, okay? So the distribution with the lowest variance or the lowest standard deviation, that means that there's not much variation in the data. So if the mean is zero and there's not much variation in the data, most of the values I see in that data set would be right around that mean of zero. So when I look at the values right around that mean of zero, there's a high relative frequency that I'm seeing those out, right? They're going to have a high relative frequency. And then values that start to get further away from that mean of zero. Notice the relative frequency falls really you know, quite a bit. It's really close to, close to the zero itself. Right? Now, as my variance goes up, what that's gonna mean is there's more variation in my data set. So now the values close to the mean will be less likely for me to see, and values further from the mean will be more likely for me to see. Right? So when I get to that highest variance or highest standard deviation here, Notice 
the relative frequency of the values near the mean has fallen quite a bit. And the values that are further from the mean here has gone up quite a bit. Right? So we can start to think about that variance or standard deviation is going to change the way our distribution looks. And I'll, I'll revisit this slide. Actually, I think I have the exact same slide that we'll look at probably about a, actually probably like three or four weeks, quite a ways out. But I just want to start introducing these ideas now about what the variance does, kind of how it fits with these different distributions of data that we'll see. And then what would the mean be? I didn't know have a picture of it here, but if I had a mean that was higher, but the variance of those two data sets were the same, a higher mean is just going to shift my distribution, right? It's going to shift to the right or to the left, depending on if it's higher or lower. Okay. Any questions on, on that school sheet? Double check here. All right, we're good. All right. So I'll show you this pretty quick. Um, in Excel, how do we do this? I've got a slide that kind of tells you how to do this, but if we had um, some data, I wanted to find the minimum, maximum, maybe calculate some variances. Got, we've seen how to do it by hand now. And we've seen it by hand, but I'll show you it's a lot easier to do in Excel, right? So one thing I'll show you, I think I didn't in Excel before, is you can add columns. So if you just click on a column and then right click on it and then insert, you can put in a couple columns without any of these cell references that we had done before, like updating or anything, right? It like, or sorry, it automatically would kind of like update or like move those without changing the cell references. So let's say we wanted to find the mean, the median, and the mode. Pretty easy. So if we have the mean, that's just the average function, right? It'd be pretty, pretty simple to find that. So we would just control shift or on a Mac command shift, Hit that down arrow and then hit enter. Okay. We want to do the median. It's just equal sign median. Go over, select that very first cell, control shift, command shift on a Mac, hit the down arrow, hit enter. Okay. What do you think the mode function probably is? Just mode, right? Pretty easy. Select the range of data that you want. We've got the mean, the median, and what probably went wrong with the mode here? We've got 50 states. The mode would be the number of deaths in a state that happens most often. What do you think is probably true about this, these observations? They're all unique, right? So the mode, when you've got a small data set with some unique values, um, might not be able to get something. But if we had something that, here, I'll just for the sake show you, right? If I did have something that repeated, it would find it for me. So those are our three functions there, um, the variance and standard deviation. Once again, I can kind of fit this column to the words by double left clicking between those columns. Variance is just going to be equals var dot. And since we have every single state, this is population data. So var dot p says calculate this variance like you would a population variance. Dot S calculates it by dividing by N minus one. Like that, essentially that formula is already built into Excel. So we can var dot P for population variance, var dot S for the sample variance. We then select the values that we want to find the variance of, control shift or change on a Mac down arrow, hit enter. And sure enough, we've got the variance calculated for us, right? And that's a lot easier than doing all this by hand. Right, a lot easier. Okay. Standard deviation, we could just do what to the variance? Take the square root. The square root uh, formula in Excel, and we'll be using this in other, you know, along the length of this course. So SQRT is how we take a square root. I click on the cell that has the variance there, and it finds a standard deviation. I could also use stdev.p, right? So population standard deviation, select my data. And notice I get the exact same answer, right? Two ways of doing the same thing. Okay. So that's not too bad. I think it's pretty easy. 
But for these common, you know, descriptive statistics, we've got to do this in Excel really quickly, right? And as we get closer to the exams, I think it's like, I, it's important you know how to do things by hand. Um, I would suggest as you're doing the connect problems, work through those by hand, don't use Excel. But once we get to the exam, if you're able to do things in Excel relatively quickly and you've mastered that, you've put the time into that, well, I'm okay with that. So you know, if you wanna have Excel open while you're working on your, uh, your test to use it, that, that's fine, right? I'm not gonna give you Excel files, like you'd have to like put the numbers in there yourself and then use some of these functions. But to me, it's like, well, a calculator and Excel are both tools to make life easier, right? And so if you want to get good and master Excel, this will be a tool that you have available on those, uh, on those exams as well, okay? Any questions over any of that? Pretty easy. So now, what I wanted to get, talk, get through today, which we probably won't get through all of it now, um, was discussing some weighted mean stuff, okay? So these are going to be some of the last couple problems you probably see on um, the Connect. And uh, it's a little bit different than what we were doing with regular means, okay? So all the data I've shown you up to this point um, had like one, every number represented one observation, right? Now the problem is that's not always the case, right? So before, we were able to give things equal weight, right? Because when we divide by n, Let me know if it switches for us here. So let's go. I see it's not picking up the Elmo thing. That's what I was that's what I'm worried about. Unless this is what they're calling the integrated camera, but I don't think it is. No, so you guys on Zoom aren't seeing anything. All right. Uh, can I do this? This is why I was using my laptop because I don't think this will pop up for me now. It'll only pop up in class. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's go back here. And I'm going to try to use this even though I'm not good at drawing with this. All right. So um, before we were doing, right? When we took the sum, this is why I try to use how I think is I can't write very well. Right? When we were finding the mean before, we were taking the sum of the x's and dividing it by n. Right? Another way to think about that was we were taking every single observation, adding them up, and dividing by n. Right? But what I could then do is just Everything divided by n, I could rewrite that so it would be x1 over n plus x2 divided by n all the way, you know, to whatever my last number is. So essentially, I'm weighting everything by 1 over n. So every observation is being weighted the same. Instead, with weighted means, we'll have... Each observation we see, it's grouped data. So I might see, um, for example, if I'm looking at average income, I might be able to go out and find average income for um, different age groups, right? But I don't have the original income uh, data that has every single person as an individual observation. It's grouped into, I can see the average income for 20 to 30 year olds is $50,000. The average income for 40 to 50 year olds is $50,000, right? That value for income represents a lot more than just one person. There was like an original data set that did have every single person, but I only have the data grouped into some type of a group, right? So we're gonna have to use weights in order to get a weighted mean because when you think about, um, the example I always give is, let's say uh, I looked at the average, um, sales in uh, fast food sales for McDonald's. Well, that represents a lot of stores. If I then look at what the average fast food sales for Berkey's, they only have like one, 
right? And so if I want to find the overall average sales across all fast food places, well, I shouldn't be treating that average that represents Berkey's the same as the average that represents every single McDonald's store, right? I want to weight that McDonald's one by however many McDonald's there are, right? So this is the idea behind weighted means. So if we, if we, you know, if we have group data and we can't give equal weighting, what do we do? Hey, this is a McDonald's example. We're going to essentially have to come up with something that we can weight the observations we see by. So these weights, W, are going to be usually some type of frequency, like some type of count, right? The number of McDonald's, right? Or the, you know, the number of students in that class. If all I see is the average grade in that class, the number of students in that class would be my weight. So what we'll do is we'll take these weights for every single observation we see, and we'll multiply that weight by whatever the value we see for the variable we're interested in. So if I have um, the income age you know, example, I'll take the number of people between 20 and 30, multiply that by the average income I see for 20 to 30 year olds. Do that for every age group, add them all up, and then divide by the sum of those weights. So the sum of the weights in my example would just be the number of people in the US that have some income, right? Or the number of people that from zero to the oldest person, right? I'll give you a couple more examples here in a second so it'll make a little bit more sense, but this is how we're gonna find our weighted mean. So I kind of already explained this process, but we'll go through each observation, multiply the weight by the value, add up the product, all those products, and then divide by the sum of the weights. So let's just look at some actual data and kind of walk through how we would do this. Okay. So here I do have um, average income in the U.S. You can go to the U.S. Census and they report this, but they, oops, they only report it by, you can break it down by race, region of the country, gender. You can break it down by certain things, but you can't see the actual original income data that has Jane Doe um, made $30,000, her demographic, you know, whatever race she is. You can't see that. So we've got this group data, and I can see here, obviously, kind of one of the reasons why I use race here is, well, we have a very different proportions of the population for each one of these racial groups, right? There's way more white individuals in the original data than there are from our other kind of minority groups. Right? So we've got this mean income. This 59,000 represents 73,000 people while this 60,000 only represents 6,000 people, right? So this shouldn't be having as much weight when we're calculating the weighted mean as this value does, right, the 59,000, okay? Um, so let's say we, just for the example, I'll just start with the males here. The process I would do is go through, I only have, think about it, I really have like four observations here because they group the data up. So what I have to do is for each one of these observations, take the weight of that group. And like I said, it's usually a frequency or here like the number of people, right? I'll multiply that weight by the value for the variable I'm interested in finding the weighted mean of, which is this income variable, right? So I'll multiply the weight by the value for the variable I'm interested in, write that number down, go to the next observation, take that weight, multiply it by that group's average income, write that number down, do that for all four of these, add them all up. And then once I add them all up, the other final thing was divide by the sum of my weights. Well, I put the numbers in here for you, but how did I find that 108,000? I just added up the weights here. Right? So once I go through and do that process, I could write that out, right? 73,000 times 59,000 plus 11,000 times 38,000, 6,000 times 60, so on and so forth, and then divide by the sum of my weights, which I wrote it out here, but if I'd already calculated it ahead of time, I could have just used that 108,000 as well, okay? Are there any questions on that before we keep moving? I wanna make sure we're, we're understanding why we have to do this. It's not because, you know, it's because we're limited on the data that's available to us, right? The data made available to us only comes in you know group uh, group data. Okay. Where's this chat box going? There we go. So how do you determine the weights? Okay, go back here. I'll show you when I do. 
So how do I get these weights? These weights have to be given to me, right? It's, it, the data is coming to me with the weights and whatever variable I'm interested in, okay? Um, yeah, you're, you're not, you're not going to have to, like, guess on what the weights are. They're going to be given to you, okay? Any other questions on that before we keep moving? Okay, so we could do the exact same thing for females here and find their way to mean. Actually, I would suggest maybe just for practice, you could actually do that. Um, it'd be the exact same process, 75,000 times 34,000 plus 14,000, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Then divide by the total number of women that we have over here. And you should be able to get that answer of 32,000. So I have a couple questions on the chat, so give me a second. Are the male and the female categories considered separate? Yeah, so think about it this way. Um, I put them all on the same table, but really this, the male income data is like one data set and the female income data is like another. Now, if we wanted to find the weighted mean income across both genders, and I only have the data reported to me in this way, what would I do then? So essentially, if I wanted to find, here I was just finding the mean income for males. I could do the same thing and find the mean income for females. But what if I wanted the mean income for everyone, regardless of gender? It's the same process, it's just now I have more groups. I go through, I have the frequency of white males times their average income, frequency of black males times their average income. Add that, add that, and then I add in the frequency of white females times their income, so on and so forth. And now the sum of my weights would be the sum of this plus the sum of these. Okay. So that's, that was a good question. Um, but here I'm treating it more so as these are like two different things we want to find. Average male income, average female income. Okay. Now that was a good question. Um, we can sadly see there's a, there's a stark difference here, right? Um, we could break this down by region as well. So one thing that I, I want to get, one point I want to get across is we're using these weights, right? Because if I have more of a certain group in the data, I want to make sure that their value is impacting that, that mean more. So if I look at this, and I look at this instead by region of the country, which one, and it doesn't matter if we look at males or females here, which one of these regions is going to influence the weighted mean the most. Yeah, it's just going to be one that has the highest weight or the highest frequency, or the highest number of people in it here. So clearly the South is quite a bit larger than these other three regions. And so that 35,000 is going to influence that weighted mean a lot more. So I'll give you another example, really easy example. If I invested, a mil so let's say I invested in a stock and its return was 100%. But I only invested one dollar, right? and then I have another stock that I invested in, and it returns negative ten percent. But I invested a hundred thousand dollars in that stock. Well, in that example, my weights is the amount of money I invested, and if I want to know what my average return was, well, then I have to figure out like I've got you know a hundred percent and negative ten, but my weights are how much money I invested. Because that negative 10 is going to impact my portfolio's return a lot more because I invested $100,000 in it as opposed to, what did I say, $1 into the, the one that returned 100 right? And that's this, this idea. Whatever has that higher weight is going to influence that weighted mean more. And here we can see that would be kind of the south. So the weighted mean is going to be a lot closer to 35 than it would be to 37,000 up here, right? Because these just aren't going to have as much of an impact. Does that make sense? Okay. Now you might be able to start to envision um, really what's going on behind the scenes with this equation is that I could use this formula, but maybe the stock price one makes a little, or the stock return one makes a little more sense. What could I also have to do? I could actually, since I'm dividing by this, what I could pull out for each observation, if I wrote all this out, so once again, this is going to be atrocious because I cannot write with a mouse. Um, let's say I had $50 
in um, one stock and I had, I don't know, 100 in the other. And it doesn't really matter what the returns are here. So maybe this return was like 11% and this return was, I don't know, 18. What I'm really doing is I'm adding those together and then dividing by the sum of the weights, which is 150. What I could do is notice this would just be the proportion of money I invested in the second stock and 50 over 150 would be the proportion of money I invest in the other stock. So I could almost make my weights proportions and then kind of get rid of my denominator there. Like that's really what's going on in that formula. But just like procedurally, it's usually a lot easier to kind of add all these up and then at the very end divide by the sum of the weights. Okay. All right, so I have no idea. I, I will try to get, um, I think Friday we'll pick up where we left off here. Um, hopefully I'll figure out why this, this computer stopped working for us. Um, but if you have any questions over anything we talked about today, uh, we'll continue to do some weighted mean stuff on Friday. And I'll for sure push that connect assignment up now since we didn't get to cover as much material today in class. Okay? All right, we'll see you guys on Friday or we'll see some of you on uh, Monday who are here today in person.